Hello and welcome to this lecture on Book 7 of the Republic um, for Introduction to Philosophy. And in Book 7 we'll find Plato continuing many of the themes that we, we saw in Book 6. We're going to continue the education of the Guardians here and we'll learn more about the kind of things that they will learn and, and how that education will, will go. But the most striking thing about this chapter, of course, is, is that at the beginning of this chapter, we have one of the most famous, if not the most famous metaphor in philosophy, um, Plato's cave allegory, which is um, really depicting in very kind of pictorial concrete terms um, some really central um, beliefs of his about epistemology and metaphysics. Um, so we, we need to um, we need to take a close look of, of that. And by epistemology and metaphysics, I mean Plato's theory of knowledge and his theory of reality. And those two things are really entwined, um, as we'll see in, in the allegory um, and how Plato describes it. And there are so many resonances here of, of, his, of his thinking about knowledge, um, his sort of ethical views on the on the ethical ob obligations of leaders and philosophers uh, that there's there's it's a very um it's a very sort of rich description and a and a rich um sort of uh, metaphor to deal with it's it's become very familiar to us i think over 2500 years so it's hard for us to sort of um go back and sort of have a fresh look at this idea because it's been used and reused so many times um, but uh, it's it's really interesting to see um, to actually see it in its context, which is what we're going to do in this course. Having worked through the rest of the book, uh, now we can really appreciate um, the allegory of the cave in its proper context in Book Seven and see how it builds on um, everything else that Plato has been talking about in the book so far. Okay, so here's the allegory and the um, a sort of depiction of, of, of what it's telling us. Um, and it's, it's basically this, this description of prisoners. You can see them sitting at the front of the cave there. Um, these prisoners, we learn, are, are, are chained so that they can't move their heads, they can't turn around. So their reality um, are the shadows that are cast on the wall in front of them. Uh, and you see at the back of the cave, there's a fire um, and there's a kind of bridge or roadway. People are walking across carrying things and it's the reflections um, thrown on the front of the cave uh, by, by what's happening at that um, at that point, the sort of the reflections that are coming from the fire. That's what creates this. Um, the shadows for the, or the shadows or images for the prisoners to look at. Um, and we're told the prisoners have been there since childhood. Um, and that, of course, suggests to us that that this is a kind of reality that for the prisoners, this is their reality. This is not some weird situation. They don't think of themselves as kidnapped because this is all they know. Um, this is simply a reality. And of course, Socrates strongly suggests that um, that connection when uh, Glaucon says towards the end here, it's a strange image and strange prisoners you're telling of. They're like us, says Socrates. Um, so this is this is the depiction of human society, more specifically of human society without philosophy. Right at the beginning, Socrates tells us this is an image, make an image of our nature in its education and want of education. Right. So this is our condition without education. And education is presented here as that ascent, the ascent to the sunlight out of the cave. That's the process of education. But education takes us completely out of our kind of cultural and social environments. It's a kind of liberation. And that's very a very typical um, way of sort of characterizing Plato's view here. Um, that edu education is a kind of liberation from the cave, which means it's a kind of liberation from the ordinary human condition, the human condition without philosophy. Um, and for Plato, that means a certain kind of um, certain kind of limitations um, in terms of knowing, in terms of experience, 
characterize the life of the prisoner um, and anybody else who has not been exposed to philosophical ed education. And I think to really to really make sense of it, again, we have to sort of remember when we looked at the divided line, we talked of these sort of four levels of knowledge. And we, we can sort of we'll read that in the description when when the prisoner becomes when the prisoner starts the ascent. Um, but we can see here the very lowest level of knowledge according to the divided line, the shadows or images. That's what the prisoners are looking at. Um, that's sort of the, the reality of knowledge and experience for the prisoners. So education for them is, is sort of making that ascent through the levels, learning to see objects, learning to see abstract things, mathematics, mathematical truths and things like that. And finally, on towards the, the world of the forms, um, ideas that exist in and of themselves and are perfect, um, unlike the actual sort of things in reality, um, things in, in sort of material uh, experience where, you know, everything is sort of subject to time, um, subject to passing away and decay and degeneration and so on. Um, so there's a fundamental sort of divide there according to Plato's thinking. All right, so to sort of make sense of, of what Plato's saying about knowledge and, and to sort of make a connection here between um, what the, these prisoners and sort of human society as it is, um, I think it, it's helpful to have a, have a sort of deeper think about this idea of seeing images um, and what that idea really means in our lives um, and how we can sort of make that concrete and make sense of it. Now, to really unpack the deeper meaning at stake here, to really, to really figure this out, we need to get to the bottom of the question of when we actually see images. And again, the, the idea behind the allegory is that we don't see the things themselves, we see images of things. We never get to the point where we can actually, like the prisoners, where we're incapable of turning around and really seeing what things are like. Instead, we see aspects of things as they are presented to us. So let's do a little thought experiment here and think about when we see images in our daily life. In other words, is it true for us, for us as representative human beings living in society? Is it true for us that we see images of things like the prisoners rather than things themselves? Is that generally true about us? Well, let's think about some of the some of the aspects, some of the areas in which we can say that our world, the world that we live in, is ruled by images, is governed by the creation and the construction of images. Well, of course, one obvious example of that is advertising, which does nothing except create images, create images of things that are supposed to be attractive to us. And the point of advertising, of course, when it works, is to make us make us identify with something, create a bond between us and an object or a, a commodity. Create a bond between us and something to create a feeling of longing in us for a particular product. It wants us to it wants to create an image around that product, to give it a certain persona, to to give it an identity that, that we can identify with. So we, we create an image. We associate that commodity, that thing, with things that will appeal to us, right? Either it's very strong, or it's forceful, um, or it's attractive, or it has some feature that, that we want to get hold of, right? It makes us feel better about ourselves even when we possess it, when we wear it, if it's an automobile, when we drive it. So we're, we're encouraged to identify with these images. However, we have to bear in mind, and this is the important thing, they are images. Advertising creates images that are supposed to entice us to identify with a product. But it's not the product itself, it's the image. It's what's created that we identify with. And the same, of course, could be said more generally about television, which, which of course creates images. And we can see this in a, in a variety of ways. If we think of television news, of course, which, um, depending, of course, on, on whether it's cable channels or local channels or, or whatever, but in any case, the news 
separates and, and divides up a news item and gives it a certain, looks at it from a certain angle, looks at it from a point of view. And so we're always given, we're always given an image of, say, a conflict or um, an incident or an accident or, or whatever is whatever is on the news. We're always given it from a certain point of view, a certain perspective. We only see an aspect of it as it's presented to us on the news. And of course, whatever it is that's, that, that's on television, it's always something that has been constructed and created. It's been put into a form that is packaged in such a way that it appeals to us. In other words, we're dealing in the realm of images. And of course, uh, another realm where images are all over the place is politics. And we can say this point, I think, I think generally, that politics is one of the one of the primary realms where we create images about ourselves and about ourselves in relation to other people. And whichever whichever country we we live in, politics thrives on images about what kind of people we are, about what kind of lives we lead, about how we are, how virtuous we are, how moral we are in relation to other people. So we create an image of our national identity through politics. And of course, politics feeds upon this national identity. It feeds upon this sense of who we are. And of course, politicians are experts in, in creating images, in creating images of um, whether it be you know working families, um, or whatever the whatever the particular image, whether it be ordinary people, ordinary Americans, um, as the phrase often goes here, politicians create an, an image of what that ordinary person is like and the troubles facing that person in in order to construct a particular political platform. So obviously, images are all over the place in politics. Religion is another realm where images are fundamental. Not only in different forms of, of worship, but in terms of how religions understand themselves. They use images constantly to to understand their message and to to encourage people to relate to them in certain ways in terms of certain kinds of behaviour. So all religions are, are associated with certain kinds of images. Finally, and I think importantly, we can think in our daily lives about how we create images of the people we see. Sometimes we create images of people, in fact I think we do it all, all the time, that we think that we, we understand somebody from say meeting them once or seeing them on the subway. We create an image of what we think that person is like. We think that we know that person. Perhaps we even categorize them. Perhaps we could even say we stereotype them. We put them into a certain group. And we do that instinctively. We, we almost automatically, we, we group and categorize people. We create an, an image of things that we associate with that person when we see them. So this is another important way in which we, we create an image. Instead of actually seeing the person, instead of seeing that person as an individual, let's say, instead of seeing their qualities, we create an image. We see an image of them. And we put them into into a sort of box, if you like, the, where where the image belongs. And we think that you know it, this obviously makes it easier for us, but of course it doesn't really help us to understand. But we you know we we live in images in our daily lives. I think when we interact with other people, and we're often sometimes you know we can be surprised when the difference between our image of a person and what a person is really like becomes apparent to us. And then it's, it suddenly becomes clear to us that all along we've been seeing an image and not the real person. So, we have to live with the truth. And I think this is where Plato is really onto something. Images are everywhere. When we live in human society, images are everywhere and we can't get away from them. And those images do not reflect, certainly do not necessarily reflect, what things are really like. Images are things that we construct so that we can find our way around. Perhaps it's more, it's more comfortable for us if we, if we can categorize the world in certain ways. Perhaps it's more, 
Um, it's more comforting for us to, to see things in certain ways, to personalize things, to categorize, and all of that sort of, sort of stuff. And to do that, we use images. However, we have to be aware that the world of images is not the world of what things are really like. In fact, it separates us from the world of what things are really like. Now, this ties in directly with the question of why is it difficult for us to leave the cave. Plato wants us to understand that be becoming enlightened or educated means learning to live outside the world of shadows. In other words, the world of images that we all construct in our daily lives and that we all live within. This means living without the, illusion, the illusions that often make our lives easier or more comfortable. In other words, it's difficult to leave the cave, and Plato describes it as being you know, painful, it, it hurts our eyesight as we try to, try to climb towards the sun, which represents knowledge. Living without those illusions that make our lives easier is, is the difficult thing about becoming enlightened or becoming educated. That's the difficult thing about learning. It's giving up those illusions. It's learning to live without those comforts that we've become used used to, those comfortable illusions that enable us to that enable us to survive. So education tears us out of that world of shadows, that, that world of images. And that's why it's that's why if we come back to the point I made about resistance, that's why it's something that we want to resist. That's why we offer resistance to the idea of education. Because it means leaving leaving behind the world of illusions that we've grown comfortable with. It means learning to see things from a completely different perspective, a world that may not be as comfortable for us as the world that we've become suited to, the world that we've grown used to and living within it. So that's why it's difficult to leave the cave. And of course Plato tells us that when somebody who's educated goes back to the, to the cave, what happens? They're ridiculed. They're ridiculed by the people who are still in the perspective for Plato of being prisoners, those people who have never left the cave. And they're ridiculed because they don't live with those illusions they've left them behind. So they seem strange and ridiculous. They don't value the things that people who still have the illusions value. They don't value those kind of things, the kind of values that are created by images. And that's why there's there's this big gulf or disparity between what it means to be educated, Plato means, of course, philosophical education, and the ordinary condition in human society of being a prisoner in a cave. All right, so when we begin this, the, the ascent out of the cave, um, one thing we learn pretty quickly from the way Socrates describes this process and how it's supposed to work is that it's not something uh, an individual can do by themselves. And we note that if we see the description here um, and how for Socrates, uh, we find there's talk of dragging someone away. And then he says, by force along this rough, steep upward path and didn't let him go before he had dragged him out into the light of the sun. And wouldn't he be distressed and annoyed? So all these words that suggest sort of pain and frustration and, and discontent um, and so even when he sort of sees the light he's still unable to make anything out because it's so bright so this so the the view of the ascent uh, as Socrates describes it um, and this this tends to be fairly um, his descriptions tend to tend to be like this uh, suggests that it's not a uh, um, a process that can, that you can do it alone, but there's an element of there's an element of of sort of um, not quite com well. Socrates says here force. So there's an element of compulsion, um, as as though you're sort of. But there, there must be an element of, of of motivation as as well. The person has to sort of desire this at some level. Um, but at any rate, the journey is is not a is not a happy and pleasant one. Um, and, and the person making the journey, the person being educated, um, has to be constantly reminded and sort of 
cajole to keep going to keep up um, along this sort of this sort of steep path and of course part of the issue here is is that um, it's learning to live without the inducements of the cave um, and that means of course the addiction to images and the way that Socrates describes us as being attached to the world of images through their sort of pull um, on our desires so getting out of the cave is learning to um, learning to 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 desire um, to desire otherwise to desire in different ways not to desire the images um, so that's a kind of painful aspect of learning um, it's almost like um, it's almost like overcoming an addiction um, more than it is like you know learning facts and figures and that sort of stuff it's a very it's a very different idea of learning um, to put that another way, it's sort of deconstructive as much as it's constructive or destructive as much as it's um, constructive in the sense that it's taking away the fascination with images. It's taking away the um, the need to distinguish things that aren't important and are trivial and just uh, respond to the sort of world of senses and its, um, and its array of sights and sounds and attractions. And it's learning not to be absorbed with those things that is part of and I, I think a central part of the task of learning a philosophical education as Socrates describes it. So this happens when we sort of make the ascent out of the cave um, that the world of the forms is just appears to be confusing we can't make anything out and as we'll see the same thing happens on the descent when you go from the sort of the, the sunlight to the dark it's the same thing right you can't you can't see anything when you make this sort of um, sudden transition into darkness or into or from darkness into light um, so so again this is sort of the first experience of encountering the world of the forms it's not this this sort of great liberation it's the sense of confusion it's the sense of not being able to distinguish anything and of course the person in this position again needs somebody again needs a teacher to show them how to think to show them how to think through um, the forms and how to think through the relations that lead us there um, and the sort of logical steps of thinking that that are going to take us on this journey so this is something again that we need to learn um, and it's not something we can do on our own over time however the freed prisoner gradually begins to make out shapes um, and finally begins to learn about the forms after this kind of um, difficult and painful journey um, there's a kind of learning um, a learning of the, the the forms that takes place which Plato characterizes as a kind of intellectual knowledge um, you know, different from the the knowledge of, of sense experience that sort of keeps us tied to the cave and distinguishing all the sort of um, the, the sights and sounds of commodities um, and that sort of interests us and keeps us locked in the cave here we begin to um, to see to see knowledge itself to see the true forms and we begin to think um, our knowledge begins to sort of take shape intellectually rather than being about responding to physical um, to physical things and shadows that excite us we begin to develop a sort of intellectual uh, way of approaching and getting knowledge about things based on these permanent truths the permanent truths of the forms um, that Plato tells us are the more perfect um, the sort of perfect things and perfect ideas in relation to the things um, that are accessible to sensory knowledge so we take a look here at what happens when the prisoner comes back to the cave um, Socrates says here and if he once more had to compete with those perpetual prisoners in forming judgments about these shadows while his vision was dim um, you know he would be the source of laughter and wouldn't it be said that he went up and came back with his eyes corrupted and that it's not even worth trying to go up and if they were somehow able to get their hands on and kill the man who attempts to release and lead up wouldn't they kill him um, so there's a that escalated quickly uh, moment when we go from the sort of person coming back who's a source of laughter um, but then they want to they want to kill him and sort of do away with him he's a threat all of a sudden 
And of course, this evokes very strongly, I think, um, the story of Socrates, Plato's teacher. Um, and that's what we've seen. That's what's being told throughout the whole book um, is Socrates' defense of philosophy. Um, and here we see we really see sort of the, you know, philosophy's sort of you know, Plato's thinking here about why Socrates was sort of was sometimes a figure of laughter of why sometimes philosophy isn't taken seriously. And here's Plato telling us that, um, you know, obviously, if you come back and you you enter the cave from from the world of light, your eyes are corrupted, you can't see anything. And of course, you're going to be a sort of source of laughter. You're going to be a figure of fun um, in that circumstance. So this is the this is the reason why philosophers are not sort of respected as as sort of, I guess, as leaders or as are a sort of official, um, you know, official leaders when they're um, in society, because it seems like I think Plato saying it looks like they can't distinguish the things that everybody else regards as important, right? They're not interested in the images and, and what they say and how they speak and how they attract um, because they're interested in intellectual knowledge and um, theoretical knowledge and not sort of um, and not the appearances of things. So, so they're simply not interested in these things that, that, that most people are interested in. Um, and this creates a kind, of, a kind of backlash and a kind of suspicion. Um, and of course, the sort of the, the, what's evoked here is, of course, the, the killing of Socrates in 399 BCE um, by the state of Athens on these suspicions of corrupting the youth. Um, and the sort of suspicions of atheism and not believing in the gods of Athens. And these are just sort of suspicions that, that developed over a long time about Socrates. And at, at the time of um, the sort of after the trauma of the, um, the end of the democracy, those things came to a head very quickly. But this is this seems to be Plato defending Socrates and defending why um, things would have looked things would have looked like this. Um, and his sort of knowledge would have looked like this to people who really didn't um, didn't understand where he was coming from. We get a very famous uh, idea in this chapter as well, a very famous metaphor for education, um, education as a whole, which Plato tells us um, in this passage is a kind of turning around. So the power he says is already in the soul of each. Um, and the instrument with which each learns uh, must be turned around. So must be turned around from that which is coming in, from that which is coming into being together with the whole soul until it is able to endure looking at that which is. So you see a very we see the very familiar division here between becoming things that things that come into being and pass away. In other words, the world of material things, the world of sense experience as opposed to things which are the, the forms that are permanent and don't pass away. And so education, um, education is, is not sort of putting things into the mind. It's not, um, it's not putting information into the mind. It's, it's not sort of cramming facts into the mind. It's a kind of turning around to face the things that are important, a willingness to look at the things that matter, the things that are really true. And this reflects a, um, I think the, what's the, really the, at the core of the idea of education, at least understood in terms of its etymology, in terms of its, the history of the meaning of the word education. It's a Latin word um, coming from this verb ducere, which means to lead. And the sort of e before it, the prefix e before it means kind of out of. Um, so it's leading out of or, or drawing out of. Education is then in, a, in this very sort of deep et etymological sense, drawing things out of the student, drawing knowledge, drawing awareness, um, knowledge and, and sort of, um, a, a, sort of a, a desire to learn out of the student. And Plato often, um, or at least in, you know, in, in, a, in the dialogue he described him in a different dialogue, he describes himself as a midwife. Um, and so that's really sort of, you know, giving a sort of physical representation of this idea of drawing out, of turning around, right? That 
all of the knowledge, all of the insight already rests in the student. The job of the teacher and the job of Socrates as the philosophical teacher is just to lead that knowledge out, to make sure it's sort of turned towards the right things so that it, it has a chance of sort of developing and flourishing into genuine knowledge, right, and sort of genuine creativity. Um, and so that's that's the sort of idea we, we have here about how we learn, that we learn when we turn towards the right things, um, when we're looking at the things that matter, and education is sort of drawing out our capacity to learn, drawing out our capacity to be affected and to absorb the things that matter, um, and to be turned away from those sort of trivial things that sort of that excite us in the cave, but are incapable of giving us a genuine knowledge of the way things are. Now we've talked a number of points, I think, about this idea of the Republic as a battle for noble souls um, in the sense of who's who's going to win, who's who are who's going to be persuaded by the philosophers um, or the sort of the sophists and the rhetoricians on the other hand. And the battle is between these sort of these young aristocratic minds um, who are destined to do great things. And we've seen this lead into, you know, Plato's kind of elitism at times where it's the sort of great natures, the natures destined for great things. You know, those are the ones that matter. What are they going to end up doing? Um, and, you know, we see that um, again here in this passage on page 97. Um, so when Socrates says about the um, about these these people that are um, that are sort of that that again he's talking about the kind of corrupted philosophers here, um, and he says, "Well, haven't you yet reflected about the men who are said to be vicious but wise?" Right. So the vicious philosophers again, the sort of corrupted ones um, who sort of practice sophistry. How shrewdly their petty soul sees, and how sharply it distinguishes those things towards which it is turned, showing that it doesn't have poor vision, although it is compelled to serve vice, so that the sharper it sees, the more evil it accomplishes. Right. So that very much reflects this theme of, you know, great natures will either do, you know, very extremely evil things or extremely good things. Um, and it's really important for those natures to be trained towards philosophy where their sort of their greater sort of creative drive will be will be sort of dedicated to doing useful things. Um, but this is this is the this is the thing that the it's, it's the battle for those souls who, if they're sort of corrupted, um, they're able to accomplish a lot of evil in society and to do really terrible things um, that presumably, you know, ordinary natures wouldn't even dream of being able to do such terrible things. So these are the souls that that, that count first and foremost. Um, and we see that sort of conflict again in this passage. Now here we, we learn in this chapter about the philosopher's burden. Um, and by that I mean the fact that philosophers are not permitted to ascend and stay there and contemplate the forms even though they really want to do that, that's all they care about. They only care about knowing the truth, knowing the forms, um, and then teaching others. But instead of that, they must be forced. So again, that theme of coercion, and we've seen that through the whole book, the theme of coercion um, and being forced to do what you're naturally best suited to do. They must be forced to return to the city in order to rule it, not for their own sake, right? They have no interest in ruling. They want to do philosophy and contemplate the forms, but it for the sake of the city, because only if uh, those who are knowledgeable in the, in sort of general matters rule, will the city be well governed. And Socrates reminds us again here, gives us a timely reminder that our concern is not with the happiness uh, of individuals, our concern is with the happiness as a whole. And of course, the implication here is um, for the philosophers themselves that philosophers shouldn't complain about being forced, you know, to rule, to being forced to be in charge, because it's not it's not about their good. It's about the good of the city as a whole. So Socrates says, 
It's not the concern of law that any one class in the city fare exceptionally well, but it contrives to bring this about in the city as a whole, harmonizing the citizens by, um, listen to this, by persuasion and compulsion, right? So presumably if persuasion doesn't work, you know, it's, uh, it's okay to use compulsion, making them share with one another the benefit that each is able to bring to the commonwealth. And it produces such men in the city, not in order to let them turn whichever way, whichever way each wants, but in order that it may use them in binding the city together. Now this, we've been tracking this for a long time as, as well, this, this sort of division between the happiness of the city as a whole. Remember that started when Socrates said, let's look at the city and then we'll find the, the, the ethical, the happy individual. Right, the happiness of the city as a whole versus the happiness of individuals. And we've been raising the question all along that those two, those two are not the same. And when Socrates gives us that famous metaphor in book five of the body politic, it makes it sound like they are the same, that we all share the same pains, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but of course, then we're reminded by these passages that, that it's really, it, it, it's, it kind of looks like each, each class and each individual in that class is being forced into a mold that serves the happiness of the city, but doesn't necessarily serve their own happiness. Um, and so this sort of, this, this dilemma, this contradiction almost has, has come up that, that, that we can have a happy city, but we can't have happy individuals. Um, if we have a happy city, that having a happy city seems to require forcing individuals to fulfill positions and functions um, that serve the city, but don't necessarily make them happy, right? The happiness of the philosophers is learning, education, uh, contemplating the forms, right? But here they're forced to, to be kind of managers and rulers of the city but it's not their happiness that matters, it's the city as a whole, right? So this is something that, this is something we, we have to wrestle with, right? What's what's the value of a happy city if it means that, that individuals themselves are not happy because they're forced to serve the city in order to make it well functioning, but where's the happiness of individuals? Um, should we worry and how much should we worry about that? Um, and so, it certainly seems that that's a sort of big, um, a big conflict here that, that Socrates has to persuade Glaucon and Adimatus that it's the happiness of the whole that's important, not the happiness of individuals. Now, there's an important point here that Socrates makes when he says, the best city is one in which rulers are least eager to rule. I think this is a, a quite a sharp psychological point and there's an sort of interesting sort of philosophical point behind it, right? That that if ruling is a sort of self-interested thing, then the, the ruler, as we've talked about before, the ruler is likely to serve their own self-interests. But so that means that the, the person that you must seek, the person that you would want as a ruler is somebody that really doesn't want it and has no interest in it because they can't possibly conceive of what they would do with the wealth and the power that that come with ruling they have no interest in those things right so so that's sort of what socrates is that's where socrates is going with this and we see that very clearly in this um in this passage on page 199 he says, if you discover a life better than ruling for those who are going to rule, it is possible that your well-governed city will come into being, right? In other words, if, if those who are going to rule would actually much prefer to be doing something else, then it's gonna be a well-governed city. For here alone will the really rich rule, rich not in gold, but in those riches required by the happy man, rich in a good and prudent life. Right, so as we've talked about, it's the, the capacity to make long-term decisions according to virtue, according to personal sort of well-being, um, not based on, on um, desire or not based on pride or passion, um, but sort of based on a conception of the long-term good. But if beggars, men hungering for want of private goods, go to public affairs, 
supposing that in them they must seize the good it isn't possible when rolling becomes a thing fought over such a war a domestic war one within a family destroys these men themselves and the rest of the city as, as well and i think we can see here from from the sort of sharpness of the accusation that certainly plato in, in having Socrates say these words is thinking back to the democracy and thinking back to the destruction of the democracy and the sort of the, the sort of failure of having um, of having ruling be a competition amongst powerful private individuals who end up using rule as an opportunity to enrich themselves and not to to improve the city. So that seems to be a, a sort of base um, intuition or, or even a sort of experience about democracy that Plato is is trying to convey um, in these in these sort of comments about how you know ruling can only be best done by those who don't desire it by those who have no interest in wealth and power um, and I think it's 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 a point about bracketing bracketing the private interests that are going to allow you to rule in in the in the general interest and of course only if you don't care about those private interests if you don't really care about wealth and 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 power because you just want to contemplate the forms right then you can sort of you'll be able to resist those inducements um but it, it's kind of interesting that socrates is um, at least as Plato is describing him, Socrates or the philosopher is able to do this because they love philosophy so much, right? It's not because they're moderate and they're tem temperate um, and they've sort of they sort of constrained their desires. There's a sense in which they have done that, but there's also a sense in which you know they're so um, they're so passionate about philosophy that everything else, including you know material wealth and money and so on. Um, none of that has any interest to them, but it's precisely that for Socrates which makes them perfect rulers. We learn about the importance of mathematics as well um, in the education of the rulers. Plato tells us a lot about um, geometry and math and how it draws us towards the intelligible realm, and he so it describes the way it gets us thinking in abstract terms. When, when we're thinking of numbers, we're not thinking of, of real things. We're thinking of kind of abstract things, right? A number can stand in for anything, it can stand in for any number of things, any number of objects. It doesn't matter what things look like. So with numbers and mathematics, we begin this process of abstraction um, that ultimately takes us towards the intelligible realm, the realm of intellectual knowledge. And of course, we know that for Plato, the summit of intellectual knowledge is contemplation of the forms. OK, so let's uh, pick out some conclusions from this week, uh, week seven. I'm sorry, chap chapter seven, book seven. The allegory of the cave, as we saw, is a powerful metaphor for Plato's epistemological and metaphysical beliefs, his beliefs about knowledge, the difference between intellectual knowledge and sensory knowledge, and the sort of ascent towards intellectual knowledge, um, and the sort of two levels of reality, the sort of intelligible realm, um, and the realm of material things which decay and pass away, whereas the intelligible realm is sort of permanent and non-changing. That's a central aspect of Plato's metaphysics. We saw this really, I think, really interesting and fascinating idea that education is not putting knowledge into minds. It's not filling you up with facts and figures and information. It's a turning around of the soul. It's a focus. Uh, it's a refocusing on what's important. So it's a focusing it away from the things that attract our attention in the everyday, the images, the, the sort of exciting, um, you know, the exciting images and commodities and flashing things that attract our attention in the everyday and it turns our attention towards those permanent things that matter so it's it's a turning around a redirection of attention and so that the way plato describes it is more kind of letting go of an addiction than it is kind of um you know conventional sort of learning or memorizing it's learning to be interested and in learning to be focused on other things and we also have this 
this idea, this, this also interesting idea, I think that philosophers are the ideal rulers precisely because they do not care about ruling and have other interests that to them are more important. So precisely because they have no interest in, in the sort of private gains that come from ruling, the ability to sort of build wealth, influence and power, right? That's what makes them good rulers. They're just able to rule in the public interest without letting those private inducements sort of, um, you know, lead them astray, lead them to do things which aren't in the, in the public interest, um, lead them to be corrupted, right? So they're able to, to sort of rule in the general interest.